Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Michael Abramoff. Uh, I'll start with a quick disclaimer. Uh, if, if I attempted to do uh, justice to Dr. Abramoff's CV during this uh, introduction, we'd have no time for the presentation. And so uh, what I'm going to provide is a, an extremely, extremely condensed version of his CV. Uh, Dr. Abramoff is a, uh, an ophthalmologist and, in fact, professor of ophthalmology at the University of Iowa. He's uh, also a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University and also a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University. Uh, he's an editor for multiple professional journals in the fields of ophthalmology, AI, and healthcare. He also serves on and chairs um, several committees and uh, think tanks in the field of AI and healthcare. And uh, the CME committee is very, very appreciative of uh, his uh, accepting our invitation today to provide us with a view of uh, AI and healthcare. And please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Abramoff. Well, thanks so much, uh, Steve, and uh, very, very happy to be presenting here. I presented uh, about half a year ago to a smaller, I think mostly family care and primary care, so this is a, a broader subject. Also, uh, the announcement says I'm doing this as a digital diagnostic founder and chairman. Um, I'm actually doing this as a professor at the University of Iowa, like you said, uh, because it allows me to speak a little bit more uh, about some issues uh, in, uh, in AI. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I have conflicts of interest. Hold on. My slides are not advancing. No, they do. Um, that are disclosed um, here. And so uh, I'm both an AI creator and a practicing physician, as you heard. So um, there's a lot to do right now about AI. Again, this comes in waves. Uh, I've seen come, these waves coming over 40, 50 years now. So here we are. Uh, and uh, people are worried uh, what is it going to mean for physician and other healthcare workers' jobs. In addition to what does it mean for patient outcomes, can we can we utilize these uh, these tools, the AIs, uh, in the right way? And uh, I think we can. What you'll be seeing here is not so much uh, the future and uh, not so much what might happen, but rather um, from uh, you know in the trenches, so to say, what actually happened with AI in healthcare so far. And and here we're talking specifically. And I'll explain what I mean by that in more detail later. Uh, autonomous AI, which really is the computer or the AI making medical decisions. And so rather than you know, talking about the potential, we're actually talking about how this is real. A really good um, paper that came out recently in the New York Journal was uh, a study of the utilization of AI um, that is actually used in clinical care. And the one that I helped to create uh, for diabetic retinopathy. So it actually does the diabetic eye exam, and then we'll explain a little bit later in more detail. It does the diabetic eye exam, uh, can do it anywhere where there's an outlet. Um, and so you can do this eye exam to protect against visible loss and blindness from diabetes. So the recommendation for many uh, stands uh, of care is that uh, everyone with diabetes gets it uh, annually. Anyway, so what you see here in this graph is the orange curve and uh, the red line is my addition, uh, which you need to take with a grain of salt. But you see that uh, HeartFlow, which is an AI that is assistive uh, for the cardiologist to measure output fractions from uh, echo and uh, NCT, um, was growing slowly. But then diabetic retinopathy is really the fastest growing AI uh, based on utilization across the US and also the only autonomous AI uh, in, in the list they studied. So they studied uh, a few hundred uh, AIs and looked at claims data. So what this shows is that adoption is actually happening in real, um, and autonomous AI specifically is being used for clinical care and pretty widely, probably over 100,000 patients annually. So I want to go back and, and do a brief recap of uh, AI history. and. I'm using some technical terms, and I will try to explain these later, but it's just a very technical field. Um, and here you see really the four streams in the different colors, the horizontal arrows, uh, about how we came to where we are today. And yet part of mimicking uh, neurons that we knew about from uh, electrophysiological studies 
uh, in silico, meaning uh, with computations and with math and later in computers, artificial neural networks. And that led to a number of inventions that ultimately created things like convolutional neural networks, recur recursive neural networks, which is essentially uh, groups of neurons uh, simulated in computer, um, you know, certain aspects of the behavior of these neurons. And then you get very interesting emergent properties from the neural networks. And you probably have seen many examples and, you know, we use them as well. Information theory started in the 40s with famous paper by Klaus Shannon, uh, my hero. And that he actually predicted what is now called large language models based on statistics in the, in the, in the 40s and the early 50s. And that led to what you now hear about a lot, which is generative AI and large language models, right? Um, the, the things like uh, Google Gemini, uh, XROC, uh, uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT. These are all generative AIs, sometimes focused on language, uh, sometimes forced on imagery. And what is interesting is they, they uh, show almost an emergent property of, of being creative. Uh, in terms of what they generate. And then finally, neurophysiology, I already mentioned electrophysiology. You could still win a Nobel Prize by studying the, the behavior of individual neurons in the 50s. And that sort of interacted with these other streams to sort of um, constrain what people were coming up with in, uh, in, in math and uh, computer science. Um, and actually, we used a lot of that in how we built uh, our AIs. So, what does it mean practically? Because in, in healthcare, uh, AI is not new. In the 60s, there were people, especially at Stanford, doing PhDs on so-called rule-based uh, artificial intelligence. Mycin is a famous example. Shortly, I've got his PhD on that in, in the late 60s. And most excitement at that time was actually uh, the fact that you could type in uh, medical data, uh, not so much the AI behind it, but just the fact that you could type in don't forget, this was punch cards, uh, etc. There were no printers, there were no displays. Um, and so this was a rare, very new, but they were trying to use it to constrain um, uh, antibiotics prescriptions. And it was nice as a PhD, but it never went anywhere. Most, most because the performance just was not very good. There's other factors, but that was a big one. In the 80s, and there was a little bit part of that, uh, machine learning came back. There was the fixed generation project in Japan. There were back propagation perceptrons were invented. And we started to look at computational capacity where you could mimic small neural networks. Um, and that started to work. And what we do today is essentially, from a computational perspective, not very different. You know, the, the, the data sets are much larger, the computers are much faster, but the mathematical, mathematical principles were already there. The problem was mostly that the input data was still very noisy. And I think that was the biggest constraint why it wasn't being used in, in actual practice. Um, meaning, for example, if you wanted to mammogram and use AI on that, you would have to scan it and it was noisy and it was just not very good performance because of that. That changed in the 2010s and especially in the last decade where digital sensors, in radiology and in ophthalmology and in, in dermatology Really everywhere, local sensors made uh, digital objective data very ubiquitous. That allowed better training of these algorithms and better performance. And that's why it's now actually being used in, uh, in my view in, in clinical practice. They're actually affecting patients uh, directly. And there are some challenges with creating AI um, uh, in healthcare. And you see ChatGPT and OpenAI. Um, and there they use uh, vast amounts of text that they get from anywhere. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, uh, data. That is not the case in healthcare. It's, it's especially with high quality data, um, it's difficult to get, if only because there's ethical issues with getting data from patients. I mean, they may be exposed to radiation, light damage, et cetera. Uh, just from that perspective, you will not get as much data as for self-driving cars or for LLMs. Um, many diseases are very rare, so even though you may want uh, thousands of examples of a, of a melanoma in the eye or anywhere else on the skin, there's only a few hundred patients every year, and so that makes it hard to get uh, the large quantity of data that, that are needed. There's some solutions for that, which I may go into. Even more interesting is that control cases, meaning patients without disease, 
uh, are even harder to get because they typically you know don't visit the clinic so they get do not get the image so well in the real world there's a lot of uh, normal data for these llms for self-driving cars that's not the case in healthcare so these are just some of the challenges with getting the data another very important uh, aspect for most ai that we try to build is that we need a truth we need to know what the image or the other data shows there's you know unsupervised learning we can get into that but ultimately to validate and to test and really build the best ais you need truth uh, and that means highly qualified and expensive experts like physicians and other experts nurses um, especially chronic disease it's even more tricky because the outcome of the disease may be a decade or more away heart disease diabetes um, and so there may not be truth for decades and we don't want to wait decades to create these AIs in the ideal case. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the, the tricky thing is uh, high quality environment, high quality operators. These are scars. Um, they are found in the healthcare settings, but especially if you want to use AI to provide better access for care, lower costs, health equity, and other aspects that we, we are focused on. That means you will be in environments where people are not trained, like maybe the radiology, the radiology departments uh, operators who are highly trained uh, experts and they will not have a, a lot of experience. So how do you deal with that type of quality of data? So these are all some of the challenges you need to overcome if you want to build AI in healthcare. Then even more importantly, I think is why uh, bother, right? Why do I, I spend probably half my life on, on, on what we're discussing here and why do that? Well, for me, um, the realization that productivity is, is key in healthcare uh, was very important. Um, and I'd like to show this picture. It's uh, John Deere uh, combines in, somewhere in the field in Iowa. Uh, I'm proud to say that I have operated a combine in the past and you know, I love that. Um, but that shows the mechanization of agriculture that you're all familiar with and the enormous uh, increases in productivity in agriculture, you know, manufacturing, that's the green line in the graph in the center. Healthcare, we haven't seen that. In fact, we have seen declining productivity and the Bureau of Labor Statistics confirms that that red line, it's actually dragging down. There's various reasons, but it's real. And so that leads to higher prices for same quality. It means lower access. It means ever increasing cost where, you know, it's starting to approach 50% of our income if we're not careful. Even though, in my view, with AI, you can make healthcare ubiquitous, meaning it's everywhere, it's very affordable, no one needs to worry about the cost. That's the goal. That um, other attempts of using digital technology in healthcare have not had the effect we hoped is seen from EHRs where there's a lot of data now that shows that systems like Epic lower rather than increase productivity of clinicians. And, you know, I saw that with the introduction about 10, 15 years ago, it permanently set back the number of patients I could see in a day. And that's that uh, you know is one of these factors uh, there's many others uh, for the decline in productivity we see in in patient care so these are just one of the problems i think that's the most important one but it causes other problems including health inequity right access uh, to healthcare is very uniquely distributed that has to do with cost that has to do with just availability of care in certain places and a nice illustration is the bottom left where you see uh, uh, the, the orange and red picture of the map of the US is where eye care is needed because these are people with diabetes uh, and all of them, like I said earlier, need an annual diabetic eye exam. Uh, and that's very concentrated in the, in the southeast, as you can see, the red is more people per county with diabetes. And if you can now go back to on the left, the purple and blue, that's the availability of eye care in terms of ophthalmologists per county and darker blue is more ophthalmologists and you see that's mostly the costs not where the need is and just from a geographic um, uh, perspective not from a race ethnicity rural um, versus urban uh, income related uh, factors sorry um, that's just an example of of these uh, unequal access leading to disparities uh, in care. And then finally, this is a, a picture coming from the American Medical Association, the ever increasing gap between the need for um, uh, clinical care in an aging population versus the availability of um, US clinicians.
And I think we're already solving all of them, even in randomized clinical trials, uh, including that we, we did a study and it was published recently, a randomized clinical trial that showed that autonomous artificial intelligence does increase clinician productivity, which is you know, was my goal. Um, that we can uh, address the bias and the access issues, uh, and there's now several uh, randomized control trials as well that show that. So what about this term autonomous? Um, there was a re recent paper uh, that we published uh, from you know, the CPT editorial panel and have a role in what is called the Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group, which advises the RUC uh, and therefore CPT on, uh, on payments for digital technology. And we created this distinction between autonomous, assistive, and augmentative uh, AI. And on the right, I discuss autonomous AI, and it's really coming from a liability perspective. If you are a physician or provider using an AI uh, for the reason that you are not comfortable doing this study yourself or you don't have the time, it would be uh, wrong, in my view, that you become liable for any errors in the performance of that AI. So if the if the if the computer if the ai makes a medical decision someone needs to assume liability and that should be the creator and that's actually ama policy now for ai uh, and i've been very vocal about that autonomous ai so means liability for the creator not for the physician using it or other provider it also means that you can offer this at a point of care and immediate right you do not need a physician in the room it can be added wherever the patient already is, so you can be closer to the patient in ideal cases. Most importantly, because we as providers, we typically think about the patients we see, but never about, in some cases, 80% of the patients who never even get to those, even though they knew it and should have our care for better outcomes. It allows you to improve outcomes for those patients that do not visit that do not get uh, care, and that, of course, improves health inequity. If you look at the left, at assistive and augmentative AI, the medical decision is ultimately still made by the clinician, even though guided in certain ways by the AI. That means the liability for its use is ultimately also with the clinician, but it also means that the patient has to be already in the workflow, and uh, they already need to visit the clinic or be seen by the physician, et cetera. But that also means that you are not expanding access you're just becoming hopefully more efficient or more accurate, et cetera, but it's much harder to do something about access. So just as a side step, because I always get asked this, what about LLMs? What about ChatGPT? Because we're talking a lot about AI and I focus much less on the technical aspects than I used to do about why is the algorithm this way or that way? Because uh, literally I can give you two sentences for any uh, LLM, ChatGPT, X, you know, Grok or or Gemini, or whatever, uh, that will generate um, a well-performing autonomous AI for diabetic retinopathy. And you see the two lines here in in blue, um, and you can use it yourself. And I'm happy to email it to you. So technically, this is solved. You don't need a, a team of hundred engineering PhDs to build these AIs anymore. It's how you build them, how you use them what they're used for and what they do that is starting to become key. And it's a good thing. Because now you get why uh, and how do we develop healthcare AI? And there's, there's one way which is uh, you know very tech oriented and it typically starts with uh, an algorithm. And then people say, well, this is exciting. It can do these things. Uh, let me try to find a role in healthcare. Look for a clinical problem. And you get a lot of that. PhD students, research groups, they say we have this cool AI, what can we do with it? And that's really fitting a square peg into a round hole and you get it. And I like this picture of the silo because I'm from Iowa. Um, you get very siloed um, development of these AIs. And that leads to what I call glamour AI, which is AI that is very cool to talk about and discuss and even publish, um, but it doesn't move the needle on patient outcome. It doesn't improve what we're trying to improve access, whatever. Um, rather, if you build AIs, in my view, that's what we did, you start with what is the best for the patient? What is the optimal outcome? And what role, if any, can AI play in that? Um, and then you build that. And of course, you can fit a round pack into a round hole. And that's, uh, and that's what we did. And I think that's just a better way. So a little bit about the specific problem, not because um, it is that important. It's more because 
we went through everything, um, FDA regulation, reimbursement. It's still the only form of autonomous AI that is FDA cleared and reimbursed. And, and you saw that from that, that paper in the online journal. So diabetes, as you're probably aware, is a giant source of health inequities and um, especially in underserved minority populations, low income. Um, 34 million people right now have it. Almost 60,000 go blind as a direct result of diabetes every year. Um, and the majority of people who need it do not get an eye exam. You can say that almost 20 to 30 percent do get it and 70 to 80 percent do not get it. So most of the patients with diabetes do not get the eye care exam that can protect them from going blind. That's why you have things like MIPS and NIDAS and star ratings trying to uh, make sure that uh, that these people get these eye exams. I realize I need to speed up a little bit. Um, and so uh, that's important because visual loss and blindness is almost entirely preventable if you catch this, um, the disease before there are any symptoms, before people have symptoms and say, I have blurry vision, I'm going to the doctor now. And so it's it's a very nice um, example of what AI might be do and might be able to do and where it has a high potential. So what I set out to do, and now with digital diagnostics, uh, which is a conflict of interest, obviously, but I have to mention it because it, you know, that's the first one, um, is this uh, autonomous AI for the diabetic eye exam. It's fully autonomous. It diagnoses both diabetic retinopathy and macular edema. It was proven to have no racial or ethnic bias. It was more accurate than retina specialists like me. Uh, and again, the medical liability is with the creator. Um, it was validated also for and in, in primary care and it uses a robotic or retinal camera. There's two other uh, similar AI, autonomous AIs on the market now, and they all use the same robotic retinal camera. So that's an interesting aspect. Um, and very important for AMA was that it maintains integrity of the patient-centered medical home. And all these AIs serve very similar uh, tasks. Sorry. So when you say, well, this now exists and is being used, people in the past and continue, that includes Congress, every, essentially every stakeholder has concerns about healthcare AI. And you have questions like, will it benefit me as a patient? As a patient, will it just exacerbate rather than improve health disparities? What happens to the data, both training data, previously uh, required and, and data used by the AI to make its diagnosis. Is there racial ethnic bias? Who's liable for errors? We already discussed that. And who's going to pay for all of this? And uh, that bias is not a, uh, a trivial problem we'll get into. Uh, and I think it's really key to all the things we have to do. So this is the process uh, or guardrails that now exist for AI in general, and especially autonomous AI in healthcare. And it starts with an, with an algorithm and a clinical question on the way on the left, like I mentioned earlier. But there was no ethical framework and that allowed, that required an ethical framework to be able to address proactively these concerns there are. You can react reactively, like we saw on social media, where people just started implementing it and now we realize it can actually harm younger people or youth. Um, I think that's the wrong way to go about it. If we base it in an ethical framework, you can proactively address uh, ethical concerns and the concerns I mentioned earlier, we'll get to that. That building on that, there was regulation developed that allowed the FDA to ultimately authorize or clear uh, this first autonomous AI in 2018. We had to solve for liability and explain that and you know address it. We needed to be able to explain and where in the development of validation and deployment of AI you can address and mitigate racial ethnic uh, bias and health disparities. Um, you need to make it part of standards of care so people actually can use it and it can be part of a quality measure like MIPS and HEDIS done by the National Committee of Quality Assurance. And then reimbursement in many cases when you talk about AI, there's ultimately going to be the question for the health system or the provider, you know, can they bill for this? And the answer is yes, but that need, required a reimbursement framework, a lot of work on behalf of CPT, CMS, uh, Congress uh, to create payments for, for AI and especially autonomous AI. And then ultimately, like I said, was it all worth it doing randomized clinical trials to see whether 
the potential benefits can actually be realized in the real world. And like I already said, very proud that last year we started showing that evidence. So I mentioned healthcare stakeholders because there's a lot of people involved in healthcare and looking at healthcare and may have something to say about AI in healthcare and especially able to sort of stop it or you know, uh, um, accelerate it or, or stop it. So any of these stakeholders have a big influence. That is patients and patient organizations like the American Diabetes Association, populations and their organizations like uh, civil rights organizations in Congress, physicians and other providers organizations like the AMA, AI creators like me, uh, bioethicists, regulators like FD, FDA and FTC, value-based care authorities like NCQA, PCORI, USP, PSDF, payers like CMS, commercial payers, even state Medicaid organizations, investors, if there's no investment, this all dies, venture capital and growth equity, and then of course, uh, Congress, uh, both at the state and the federal level. And big, big influence, especially on the right, because they have been so helpful is the AMA, National Hispanic National Medical Association, National Medical Association. Without them, uh, there would be none of this. So what about this ethics? Because why am I talking about ethics when we're discussing AI? Now, it really goes back to, um, to what can we, what, how should we be building and looking at AI? And there's some very fundamental bioethical principles and what I like to say is that these are thousands of years old and they are shared across most cultures. And these are benefit or non-maleficence, do not harm in the first place, autonomy of the patient, justice or now called equity and responsibility. These are so old and so common and such important bioethical principles uh, that we published a paper starting from these, how can you embed AI in such an ethical framework. And that was published in the American Journal of Bioethics. And this is very interesting because it's never published in there, but they essentially do a paper and then they have many other authors responding to it, and it becomes an issue. And there's like 16 papers responding to this framework for AI, ethical framework for AI. And as a side step, you can see that ethics in AI is, is becoming very important and big tech companies um, have tried to do that by creating uh, so-called AI committees that then oversee what the engineers are doing. And in my view, we, we did it differently. Let, let me just say that. I think it's better to put it in the hands of engineers where you give them metrics, where you give them measurable um, quantitative measures for how much, what they're doing and what uh, how, how they can measure how much it meets a certain ethical principle. Because then you don't have outside experts weighing in essentially with words, with something that is not measurable. You can, they can just say, well, it's not ethical. Well, and then the engineer or the physician like me will say, well, I'm ethical, duh. And, and there's, you can have a lot of debate about words, but you're not saying I meet this ethical principle 80%. Well, you actually should meet it 85%. Okay, I will work on meeting 85% or not, right? I mean, that's a very different uh, discussion. And so that's the the other way where you can embed ethics in, 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 a, in an organization, um, and, and I think that's the better way. So how does that work? So here you see on the right sort of a figure from that, from that paper where you see the different ethical principles and then maybe an algorithm or a healthcare system or even a provider in the middle of it because it's, there's a tension. Let's say that you look at benefit versus autonomy. We all know that, that, that there's a lot of evidence that uh, smoking cessation is better for outcome. You know, people are less likely to die from lung cancer. Um, and so you could say, well, people should make that own decision. But then we decided as healthcare uh, system that we definitely recommend and ask people and recommend them to stop smoking. Well, that affects their autonomy. You're not letting the people, the patients make their own decisions fully. Uh, you're trying to influence them by doing the right thing. So you see this tension. You can say, well, I only care about patient benefit, uh, and then that's 100 percent, then maybe 80 percent, but you can actually improve patient benefit by decreasing their autonomy. And that's the tension field to operate in. It's the same for justice and equity. And we saw that uh, with COVID vaccinations during the, uh, the during the pandemic, where certain um, the decisions had to be made about who gets the, the vaccine first. 
And so that is the tension we live in. And in this case, it's an AI system. But again, any physician, any healthcare system is in this tension field as well. And uh, I think a big insight of this paper, it was not new, but we sort of reproduced it in a fundamental way, is that we can measure how much you need these different uh, ethical principles, but not one metric. It's many metrics for each bioethical principle. But once you have that, you can now develop, for example, regulation based on it, because you can say you need to meet this ethical principle at least 80%, 70%, 90%, whatever it is. And that was a lot of work with regulators. And you see important uh, thing with FDA on the left, foundational considerations, uh, it allows us to make together with CMS and CPT uh, a reimbursement framework and then with FDA again, uh, based in ethics, how uh, you should address bias and uh, maximize health equity uh, with AI. So it, it, it's, I cannot sketch and explain enough about how important this ethical framework was for all the work that came after uh, on AI. As an example, this was uh, done together with FDA leadership what is called foundational considerations. It says in the title, utilizing ophthalmic images, but it's really for any AI using um, vector input, meaning images or, or sound data, et cetera. And it does things like, well, how do you measure the quality of truth? How do you measure the performance of the AI? How do you create a threshold for what you consider safe, right? 80% sensitivity, 90% sensitivity, 100% sensitivity, which is not achievable. And so how how do we define these processes? So this was very important for FDA to um, base its decisions on and ongoing regulation. Um, let me skip that in the interest of time. Similarly, you know, bias and, and health equity, we saw recently um, again uh, bias cropping up in this case from uh, from Google's Gemini, where they had very biased uh, AI for asking questions. Um, and that was uh, not that was planned, right? It was not immersion bias where people inadvertently hadn't biased AI. This was on purpose on the left. On the right, you see that actual patient harm has been done with inadvertent bias. A, a, a payer, it was a paper in Science a few years ago, very good study by my colleague Obermeyer, um, where it showed that uh, black patients. Um, got worse um, outcomes because an AI that was supposed to manage who got which care, which type of care and which urgency was biased against them because cost rather than outcome was used uh, for the training. So there has been actual harm from biased AI, but this was inadvertently, right? It is even worse, of course, if you start building it in. And there was actually a really interesting Netflix series called Coded Bias about skin color and bias for face recognition. And we see that very much if we try to build AIs using skin pigmentation uh, for melanoma or retinal pigmentation for uh, diabetic retinopathy. But it can, be, um, it can be mitigated at various aspects. And I'm not going to go into this in the interest of time, but uh, there's this very interesting um, paper where we analyzed all the phases in the creation of an AI where bias can inadvertently hopefully be introduced, but also has to be uh, and should be mitigated. And so that's an, uh, an FDA considerations paper, it's called. And uh, we're starting to see the impact in, in various uh, approval process that, that they're involved in. So it allows you to say, well, what about training data bias? Allows you to say, well, access bias, right? If I decide to make an AI that's very, very expensive, low income, uh, clinics uh, located in low income areas will not be able to afford it. And now you have access for more wealthy population uh, and the underserved population is, you know, you exacerbate health disparities depending on how you plan the AI, actually the cost of the hardware and software related to, to the AI. So you can see it's not just about the training set. There's ways to overcome uh, these biases. And what is very interesting is that we used um, a more biomarker based approach to create AI. So this is a little bit technical, but there is ways of overcoming bias from the design uh, as well as from validation. Um, sorry, I'm going back, excuse me. Um, similarly, you, it may surprise you that you can use an ethical framework to create AI reimbursement. So how do you pay for AI when typically payments in uh, healthcare are only based on uh, in value-based care or various um, 
outcome-based measures uh, and a fee-for-service, of course, on physician work or provider work or views. And when you have an autonomous AI, there's no provider work effort. And so how do you still create a reimbursement that on the one hand um, allows utilization, as you saw in that study in the Online Journal of Medicine, and the other hand drives down costs rather than driving up costs because that one of the goals is to increase productivity and lower healthcare costs and make it more ubiquitous. And that's what this framework does. And actually it goes through full analysis of the various alternatives that exist for how you uh, pay for AI, how you can organize that, and uh, what we found a solution. And it was very interesting that CMS has its own process, but they, they we went with a certain recommendation of $55. And three years later, they came out with $55, which was very cool. Um, and so that leads to finally, there's now autonomous AI, MIPS and HEDIS measures. So you can close a care gap with an autonomous AI that does a lot of work. Uh, together with NCQA, and most importantly, um, a lot of work with CMS, Congress, uh, private payers on creating uh, reimbursement for 92.9. And like I said, I'm, I'm taking this example because it's really the only autonomous AI currently be reimbursed. There's other people working on autonomous mammography, autonomous uh, skin cancer detection, autonomous uh, colposcopy. And so more is expected to come out, but it will likely be very similar. And definitely the ethical framework can help a lot of that. So finally, uh, randomized clinical trials are starting to show that indeed, uh, if you randomize patients to without AI and with AI, health equity, uh, health disparities are improved. I mentioned uh, productivity gains, immediate productivity gains of about 40% using autonomous AI. It was a big study uh, in Bangladesh, so in a very low income country. And still, we were able to increase productivity immediately with uh, 40%. So I will stop here because I understand, um, you know, there's typically time for questions and uh, stop sharing my screen. Let's see, maybe questions in the chat. Let me check. Can you hear me? Sorry, were you expecting? Uh, I, I have plenty more material, so uh, hours of it, in fact. But let's see, we're at the 55 minute mark, so. Oh, well, we have one online question. Yeah, I've, I saw it. Um, so the question was uh, whether there's, uh, you know, free. Um, uh, diabetic eye exams at state fairs are absolutely you you can do that you know someone is ultimately paying for all this but um yeah that's that's absolutely very doable the, 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 this specific ai um you know requires only high school graduation to operate it so that's that's one of the aspects right where uh access bias or adoption bias is is tricky because if it can only be used by very highly trained operators you're not bringing it to the populations where it needs to be. So that's that was one important aspect uh, of this AI. Yeah, Any concerns for AI scribe apps? Yeah, so you, again, so this is a privacy concern, right? So uh, based on ChatGPT, Nuance and others are starting to create uh, scribes um, and it's unregulated, right? It's an unregulated space. So for your understanding, there's the FDA regulated AI where you make claims about it being used um, on patients um, where you can prescribe it and where you need to um, prove these claims to FDA for them to, to clear it. Um, however, if you do not make those claims, or if you're outside of the purview of FDA, like most AI in back office in Epic and, you know, the, the one that I mentioned with uh, that harmed black patients, that was all developed, for example, by payers for care pathways. Uh, ones like this, there's no oversight whatsoever. You have to realize that. So do we know what happens to the data? Um, maybe. Um, do we know what will happen to the data in the future? 
uh, do we have do we know whether these are biased in some way because they interpret it based on historical examples? Uh, we do we do not know any of that. So I care greatly about FDA regulated AI because there we we can prove well you know typically if if FDA clears it that it's safe, effective, free of bias or bias has been mitigated, etc. And that's just not the case for the others. I have I've just less to say about it, but it is concerning because in Congress and across stakeholders. People take all AI as the same. And now you say, well, maybe we shouldn't do any AI in healthcare. And that, that would take away all the advantages that specific AIs have. Are there other applications of assistive or autonomous AI being considered for implementation? I, I don't know that. No, I, that's not a question for me, I think. Okay, if, if there's no further questions, do you want to wrap or, sorry, I thought there would be more questions. Are there any questions in the auditorium? Maybe it was too technical or too complicated. All right, I'm hearing no questions from the auditorium. No. Thank you very much for presenting today. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me. Have a great day.